Welcome All right, everyone. thanks everyone so much for joining. I think we're gonna go ahead and get started. Um, we have a few more people coming into the room, but uh, this is being recorded. I'm gonna turn it over to Ali and Leslie to introduce today's speakers uh, in case presentation. Thanks so much. Welcome everyone. Thank you so much for joining us for today's session. Um, this is a ASCP, ASC combined cytology project ECHO and the topic for today's sessions will be breast fine needle aspiration. I'm Ali Lowe and I'm joining Dr. Dan Milner and Dr. Leslie Lomo in hosting these sessions and our first presentation. Today we will have two. Uh, the first presentation will be a 10-minute didactic on breast fine needle aspiration. Um, this is a presentation by Dr. Kelly Ernst, who is a clinical assistant professor of pathology at Stanford University, who happens to have gotten laryngitis yesterday. So unfortunately, she could not speak. Um, so kindly, Dr. Dano Rosano, who is a clinical instructor of pathology at Stanford, has stepped in to do the actual presentation for her, but both um, folks and the rest of the panel will also be available to answer questions by Q&A. So if any point over the course of the session you have any questions, please put them in the Q&A area and we will get to them as well. Thank you so much, Dr. Ernst and Dr. Rosano. Please go ahead. Absolutely. Thank you, Dr. Lowe. Um, and thank you to Kelly Ernst uh, for putting this presentation together. And uh, just disclaimer, I'm not a breast pathologist. I am cytotrained, but uh, we do have Kelly uh, in the chat. So please direct your questions. Um, and she's she's quite the expert in breast and FNA uh, cytology. So um, I will go through the presentation now and uh, let us know if you have any questions. All right. Uh, so of course, if you are familiar with uh, FNA, you are probably um, familiar with techniques. But if, if you don't have this um, test in your practice, uh, you know, you, one of the ways to reduce uh, pre-analytical errors is to be properly trained. And it seems like such a simple test, and, and, and it is but it must be performed in the, the correct way uh, to get the results that you're looking for. Um, so if you uh, are looking for resources, the USCAP um, Academy has actually posted some wonderful videos and they're, they're very short. Uh, Kelly has curated a couple of them for you and you'll find the links in this presentation. Uh, but of course, it starts with informing the patient and explaining the procedure, uh, making the patient very comfortable and draping uh, appropriately. You may be performing an FNA by palpation or with the advantage of ultrasound, um, and you may or may not be using lidocaine for numbing. Typically, it's performed with a 23-gauge needle, and uh, you can use suction as well, especially for breast uh, you might want to use a syringe uh, with or without a gun. Um, okay, here we are um, with a, the smear preparation uh, video reference here. Uh, now, a smear preparation is extremely important, so I definitely encourage you, even if you are performing FNAs, to go ahead and watch this video. It's only about four minutes um, to prepare the appropriate oval smear uh, technique. So in the last few years, uh, there have been a, a new classification system uh, from the IAC. Oh, if I can just mute, it, um, it sounds like somebody is not muted in the background. Huh? Uh, it's, huh? it's, it's, it's not your microphone. Oh, um, so there is a new classification system for uh, breast fine needle aspiration uh, by the IAC, the Yokohama system. This was led by Andrew Field, um, and this is typically what's going to be in use uh, for reporting the cytology of breast lesions, uh, which has in, uh, been divided into five categories, um, and it's insufficient, uh, benign, atypical, suspicious, and normal. Uh, so each approximate risk of malignancy uh, which of course is approximate because uh, this is 
created by you know, uh, comparison with the surgical, which not all lesions end up with a surgical component such as benign. Um, and so this is of course for approximate. Um, this helps determine what's next in the step to a definite diagnosis if needed any next steps. And um, if we'll go through each one of these categories, of course, and um, just briefly, and we'll end on this topic as well. So we'll talk about that a little bit more. So um, the first category, inadequate or insufficient. Um, so while the system is sort of akin to like the thyroid Bethesda system in that you are looking for uh, cells uh, in, in an inadequate amount, um, an, an inadequate or insufficient call um, can, can actually be uh, the definitive answer. And if that if the cells, if it's posicellular and it's expected to be posicellular, um, or if you know you don't have a lot of ductal cells, but the clinical picture fits and the radio picture fits, um, this is an appropriate call. Here are some examples of how um, this could be an appropriate call. Like if it, if you are expecting that it might be an abscess, or you're expecting just to aspirate cyst fluid. Um, and you wouldn't necessarily have a lot of epithelial cells in the lesion. Um, so if you are expecting uh, something from radiology, you have a mass lesion, you can palpate a mass lesion, and it looks more malignant, um, then you would, in order to have a uh, cellular enough aspirate, you're looking for at least six to seven epithelial tissue fragments with around 15 to 20 cells each. Um, and that's so you can adequately assess for the presence of myelopithelial cells. Um, so an inadequate smear um, would be things like uh, preparation artifacts, um, which we have an example of. You know, if you've got too much of this crunchy ultrasound gel obscuring the cells and um, too many erythrocytes, things like that, that is not going to be an adequate smear. The next category is benign. Of course, if you are doing uh, breast FNAs, this is a familiar picture. You're seeing um, large uh, cohesive sheets of cells and they look very benign. They're very uniform. There's no atypia in the forms of architecture like punched out spaces or um, single, you know, malignant appearing adhesive cells in the background. And rather you have bare bipolar nuclei in the background very reassuring sign of benign. On higher power, you would expect to see in the sheets, uh, all of the cells should look very round, smooth, contoured nuclei, not prominent nucleoli, and um, you would have overlying myoepithelial cells, which you can see all of these little guys here uh, overlying the ductal epithelium and bare bipolar nuclei in the background. Of course, you 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 know you want to look out for things like um, apoptotic figures, which can mimic um, myoepithelial cells. So um, just just be on the lookout for that. Of course, uh, apocrine metaplasia, of course, can be seen in things like fibrocystic changes, and in and of itself, uh, can be a benign feature um, and is al allowed to have some atypia, but. Uh, in the form of, you know, you have a little bit of nuclear enlargement here, but the cells themselves are not crowded. Uh, you don't have pleomorphism. You don't have irregular nuclear contours. You don't have any mitosis or necrosis in the background um, to make you think of something like apocrine carcinoma. So um, you can see that these are cells are very uniform uh, in, in their architecture and the way that they're relating to each other. Um, so that's a reassuring sign of benign. If you're performing breast FNAs or any FNAs, you're well familiar with what an abscess looks like. You're going to see a lot of those uh, inflammatory cells in the background. And uh, just, you know, maybe fibrocystic debris or something like that. Pretty easy to recognize that. Fat necrosis, Definitely something um, you're going to encounter in your FNA practice of the breast, characterized by uh, lipid laden macrophages and histiocytes in the background, some scattered inflammatory cells, and uh, giant cells. 
lactational change, uh, of course, would correlate with history. Uh, but you, you see um, a lot of this uh, proteinaceous debris in the background. Um, it can be a bit cellular and you can even have some mitotic figures because it's an active process. Uh, but when you look at the cells, um, in addition to the proteinaceous background, which can give it away, uh, the cells are very uh, uniform and regular and they're not hyperchromatic, they're not pleomorphic, and they don't have atypia. Um, definitely something to be aware of. Uh, we saw something similar uh, to this in the beginning when you see the larger tissue fragments. If you have something like uh, usual ductal hyperplasia, um, no signs of atypia, the, the um, holes that you're seeing in the ductal fragments, they are not punched out. They're more like slit like. Uh, you don't see any evidence of clonality, and you see more of a streaming effect. The cells are not oriented towards the holes then uh, you're not worried about signs of um, ADH or atypical ductal hyperplasia or worse. Um, of course, you're going to encounter a fibroadenoma in your practice of breast FNAs uh, and pretty um, readily uh, easy to spot, I would say, uh, because it has a very characteristic um, architecture. We often say that it's antler shaped or drumstick shaped, and um, the architecture is reassuring when the ends are, are very blunted and you're not seeing a lot of uh, angulated or spindly shaped um, clusters. And so um, you, of course, want to look at out for strong pack fragments and uh, make sure there's not higher cellularity there and look at the background, you see these bare bipolar nuclei scattered throughout. It's a reassuring sign. So the atypical category uh, is defined as, it's gonna look mostly benign, but you're having some features um, that may be seen in malignant ones. And this category is really created to, to keep the high negative predictive value of the benign category and the high, positive predictive value of the malignant category intact. And so um, you can put things in here, um, again, that mostly look benign, but you see some atypical features. Um, for example, this fibroadenoma um, on low power has a normal architecture, which we saw in the last slide. Um, but on higher power, you're seeing some epithelial cell atypia in the form of crowding, a little bit of nuclear enlargement, anisonucleosis, these nuclei are becoming more prominently seen. Um, so these features would lead you down um, uh, FNA designation of atypical. Um, seeing increased stromal cellularity in the background, um, a phyloides tumor can have some ductal epithelial fragments um, it, that look like fibroadenoma for sure. Um, so be on the lookout for stromal fragments with increased cellularity. Of course, things like stellate architecture, um, rather than the, the blunted ends that we were seeing uh, prior in epithelial cell fragments, or if you're seeing stromal fragments uh, with high cellularity, again, the stellate architecture would go more towards the atypical category. Any kind of papillary lesion or micropapillary lesion uh, would get you there um, as well. Uh, spindle cells, of course, uh, things that um, could be malignant. Uh, you often, you can see spindle cells like in fibromatosis, for instance, um, metaplastic carcinoma, those things. Um, next category, suspicious for malignancy. Um, so if you're, you're feeling like this, the lesion is malignant, but you don't have a, a lot of uh, material you uh, can go with suspicious for malignancy and you should try to uh, state what type of malignancy you're suspecting when it's possible. So here, it's a little bit posse cellular. Uh, you don't have a lot of material, but you do have single dispersed cells. Um, and in this case, suspicious for lobular carcinoma, you have your nuclear pleomorphism and irregular nuclear contours to point to that direction. Um, of course, you know, smearing technique is very important in that you didn't create artifact, artifactual disbursement of, of individual cells. So, of course, taking this in the context of the entire slide and making sure you didn't accidentally um, 
crush, crush the cells in the preparation technique. So malignant category, again, has a very high pr positive predictive value uh, it, when you uh, isolate this to cases that are unequivocally malignant. And you should always state the type of malignancy whenever possible. And so, of course, this is going to be uh, cases where you have high cellularity, the cells are um, you know, in single cells or in small clusters abnormally seen, and they're characterized by the typical uh, atypical fragment or uh, nuclear characteristics like high NC ratios, nuclear pleomorphism, uh, even atypical mitosis, if you can find that. So um, when you have a low grade lesion, um, these cell, cells may not be as ugly as uh, easily diagnosed, um, but you, when you have an absence of myeloepithelial cells, um, that can help you get to a, a, a diagnosis of malignant more easily. These cells are quite uh, crowded as well. They show some nuclear atypia and they're very hyperchromatic and very dark. There's some single scattered cells in the background um, and you don't see myeloepithelial cells. Lobular carcinoma, similarly, it's going to be more dispersed. Uh, single cells that show nuclear atypia maybe have some vacuolated cytoplasm, um, and they can, they can have more of an eccentric nuclei. Uh, that's more of the features of lobular carcinoma. Medullary carcinoma, you can also um, diagnose in FNA and you would see uh, large syncytial sheets of uh, cells here. And of course, the very characteristic sign would be the background uh, lymphocytes. Mucinous carcinoma, uh, you may have uh, single dispersed cells and uh, fibrillary mucinous background, pretty easy to spot there. Metaplastic carcinoma, like I mentioned, uh, you're gonna have some of those uh, spindled cells or squamoid appearing cells in uh, the tissue sheets. So back at this uh, category of diagnosis for breast FNAs, uh, again, this, you know, this really um, helps direct the management, but it's, it's not an isolated test in and of itself. It's, it's part of the triple test in that it needs to uh, line up with the clinical examination in the imaging impression and the, the biopsy, uh, if you have an adequate smear for that lesion, um, then you know, all together, you could uh, potentially diagnose this breast cancer, um, all, all of these things combined with 100% accuracy, which is fantastic. All right, and that's it for um, our presentation. Please let us know if you have any questions. Thank you so much, Dr. Rosano and Dr. Ernst for that amazing presentation and overview for the breast ideal aspiration diagnostic categories and specific entities. If folks have questions, please do put them in the Q&A. And this session is being recorded. So the um, link for the session will be emailed out by Dr. Milner, I think, subsequent to the session. And it should also have um, maybe the links, we'll try and add in the links to the FNA technique and the FNA smearing technique videos that you presented here. Um, I am gonna move on to our next speaker, which, and maybe if you could perhaps stop sharing your screen, Dr. Rosano, though that was a beautiful heart, I love it. Um, and then Dr. Miras Bayou, if you could please start sharing your presentation and I will let, Folks know that Dr. Miras Bayou is a third year resident at St. Paul's working with Dr. Biraket as well. And um, her presentation will be on the spectrum of breast cytology cases seen over a typical month at St. Paul Hospital. And this is our only other presentation for today. So once she is done, really, there will just be time for discussion and questions. If you all have them, and please do put any thoughts that you have or questions that you have in the Q&A. Thank you so much.
Oh, uh, thank you, Doctor. Uh, I am Raf. Uh, I am third-year pathology resident at Saint Paul uh, Hospital, uh, Millennium Medical College, and today I will be presenting on spectrum of breast cytology specimens seen over a typical men's uh, at our cytology unit. Uh, so, uh, as a background. Um, uh, we do have a 12 year of uh, experience. Uh, our pathology unit is established 12 years back and we have 10 pathologists, one cytopathologist, and we do have 15 residents, five uh, first year resident, five second year resident, and five uh, third year residents. Um, uh, the total number of cases seen at our cytology unit uh, is variable uh, depending on the men's. So overall, we see around 500 to 600 uh, cytology cases within a typical men's. Uh, and from those cases, uh, around 10 to 13 percent, around 60 to 70 uh, are breast cytology specimens. So most of the breast cytology specimens are FNA specimens. Uh, and there are also few uh, breast nipple discharge cytology uh, specimens. Most of our patients are female patients. More than 97 percent of uh, our patients are female patients. So for this uh, presentation, we analyze the uh, um, F cytology cases seen over the past months within uh, March. Uh, so we do have wide uh, patient age range, uh, ranging from 10 years to 61 years. Um, most of the lesions seen at our site are uh, right side breast lesion. 50, around 56% of the lesions are right side breast lesion. Uh, around 40% or 39% of the case are left side breast lesion. Uh, and the uh, uh, remaining uh, about 5% of the case, around three cases, uh, were uh, bilateral breast lesions. Uh, majority of the case are uh, done by palpation guided and they are primarily done by residents with the help of the pathologist and only eight cases around 13 percent of the case are done by ultrasound guidance via uh, interventional radiologists and uh, pathologists and we use twin one gauge needle uh, with suction uh, we do not use needle holder and we uh, do around two to four passes depending on the yield for uh, fibrotic lesions with a minimal cellular yield uh, we will do more passes and we use uh, air dried rice or uh, gym sustain uh, because of limited resource. Currently, we are not doing pap stain for breast cytology specimens. Uh, we only use pap stain for uh, only for cervical cytology specimens and cell block and immunohistochemistry are not also done at our facility because of limited resources. Um, this is uh, a real to give you a brief idea about our setup. So this is uh, the first picture shows our reception area. So uh, in our setup, the patients uh, are cytology uh, studies are ordered by uh, primarily by the clinicians, but they are done by us, either by the residents or the pathologists. So this is our cytology unit. This is our reception area. And the second picture is site at which we uh, do we evaluate our patients and we uh, take specimen. Uh, the, uh, the the two pictures on the right side shows our staining uh, area. Uh, so uh, we do not do on site. Uh, uh, adequacy evaluation. Uh, most of our patients are appointed uh, after 24 hours after specimen is taken and the result will be signed out within uh, 24 hours. Uh, so uh, since uh, we are the one who are doing the uh, FNA uh, procedure, we do have uh, uh, adequate access to take a proper clinical history, including family history, a relationship of symptom with the menstrual cycle, uh, recurrence, duration of illness and we also have access to do a well detailed physical examination uh, and uh, ultrasound uh, only about 44 percent of uh, our patients have ultrasound evaluation prior to uh, FNA procedure and uh, only four uh, patients over the past months which is around 6.5 percent of patients have uh, mammography uh, so uh, based on uh, our uh, data uh, from our uh, last month's reporting, majority of our We seem to have lost sound. 
Maref, did you get muted? Marif, can you hear us? We can't hear you. Am I the only one not hearing her? No, I cannot hear her either. Yes, I lost my visual too. For oh, it looks her. like she, it looks like we lost her completely from an internet connection. Um, okay, sorry participants. Do you have us just a minute or two to get this back on? Maybe Barakat can check with Maraf to see if she fell off or not. Can you let us know, Barakat? Oh, here she goes. All right. Maraf, are you back? Yeah, I'm back. Okay, great. Can you hear me? Go ahead and go ahead and resume where you were on slide seven. Okay. It's visible, right? Uh, slide seven, I think. Yeah, okay. we can right see. There. Thank you. Sorry about that, everybody. Okay, go ahead. Okay, sorry for the interruption. So majority of the cases that we send with, with that we see over men's uh, are being classified under banning category, which contribute for about 69% of the cases, uh, followed by a malignant, which contribute for about one fourth uh, of the cases. And we also have non-diagnostic, uh, suspicious and uh, atypical. Uh, cases. So uh, the first uh, category, which is non-diagnostic, we have only uh, one case which was signed out as non-diagnostic. This was a 35-year-old female patient uh, who presented with left breast ill-defined uh, nodularity. Uh, and on subsequent repeat cytology evaluation, it was found to be uh, benign. And morphologically, the smear uh, shows uh, hemorrhage only. It doesn't have adequate uh, sales for cytologic evaluation, thus it was signed out as uh, non-diagnostic. So the second category, it's benign. Majority of uh, the case fell in this uh, category. Around 42 cases uh, were signed out as uh, benign, which contribute for uh, around 69% of the cases. And all of the patients with uh, benign diagnosis are female, uh, with the exception of one uh, male patient. Uh, the age is, uh, range is uh, quite wide. It ranges from 10 years to 51 years, with the average age range of around 32 years and the size uh, also uh, of the lesion also varies from one centimeter to four centimeters the average size of the lesion being 2.5 centimeter and among these 42 patients 17 uh, have ultrasound evaluation prior to uh, FNA and uh, on ultrasound um, uh, assessment, uh, around 10 of the case were uh, evaluated as uh, classified as by uh, category two, uh, and they were considered as uh, probably, uh, they were considered as benign lesion on ultrasound. Six of the cases were classified as uh, by category three lesions. They were uh, considered as in probably a benign category, and uh, one lesion was classified as uh, by category four A, which is a uh, uh, low uh, grade of suspicion for malignancy. Uh, so uh, among the benign uh, diagnoses, majority uh, of the cases were fibroadenoma, which accounts for more than 50% of the cases. In fact, we do have around uh, uh, 27, 29 cases of fibroadenoma and followed by galactosella, which contribute for about, uh, uh, which was, uh, which were about four cases, uh, followed by duct ectasia, breast abscess, and granulomatous inflammation, fibrocystic change and uh, fat necrosis. Uh, so uh, these are some uh, photomicrographic images showing the, some of our benign diagnosis. You can see here these nice uh, antler-like branching clusters of bland epithelial and myepithelial cell clusters. And you can also see in the background uh, containing numerous uh, bare nuclei, myepithelial cells. You can see this nice branching antler horn clusters. And the uh, fourth picture shows this uh, 
uh, stromal uh, fragment, uh, this fibrillary stromal fragment. So this uh, case was uh, confirmed by histology and it was as, uh, on histologic evaluation, it was a fibroadenoma. Uh, this is also another picture taken from histologically confirmed uh, case of fibroadenoma. You can see these nice branching clusters with uh, abundant uh, bare nuclei in the uh, background, bland epithelial clusters are seen here too. Uh, this is also another branching uh, antler-like uh, uh, cluster. So uh, this is also another photomicrograph showing a uh, benign uh, breast lesion, another benign breast lesion. Uh, you can see these nice gland epithelial clusters, branching clusters, and bare nuclei in, in the uh, background. So this is a closer view showing cells having a minimal uh, pleomorphism. They look bland morphologically. So this is uh, aspirate uh, taken from a 30-year-old female patient presented with uh, right breast mass. Uh, so uh, the aspirate grossly was cases. And as you can see in the picture, we do have this nice multinucleated giant cells. And we also have here a nice well-formed uh, epithelioid uh, granuloma here. Uh, so uh, in, in the uh, 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 in same slide, there were also area of uh, necrosis, as you can see in the picture. So uh, this case was uh, signed out as uh, necrotizing granulomatous inflammation consistent with tuberculosis. And uh, gene expert test was done uh, from uh, the uh, aspirate and uh, gene genetic material of mycobacterium tuberculosis closest was uh, detected and you can see here these two nice uh, well uh, nice uh, multi-nucleated germ cells and uh, the background containing numerous mixed inflammatory cell infiltrates so this is uh, another uh, case uh, from right breast lesion from another uh, female patient. Uh, you can see here the background containing numerous intact and degenerating sheets of neutrophils. And here we do have a well-formed epithelial granuloma and multinucleated uh, giant cells. We also uh, have done gene expert test for this case too. And uh, the genetic material for, for mycobacterium tuberculosis was also detected in this case, and this was signed out as suppressive uh, granulomatous in inflammation consistent with uh, tuberculosis. So uh, the third category is atypical. So we only have one case which was signed out as atypical. It was 20 year old female patient. Uh, she has a three by three centimeter firm mobile mass over upper outer quadrant of left breast. And on ultrasound evolution, it was classified as viral category uh, three. And uh, on microscopy a smear, it was a quite cellular smear. It was a quite cellular smear consisting of uh, these branching clusters of bland epithelial and myepithelial cells and uh, uh, numerous bare nuclei. And but there were it was quite cellular and there were also few atypical cells with enlarged nuclei. And uh, there were also three dimensional crowded groups and it was signed out as atypical. Subsequent external biopsy was done. Uh, and the external biopsy diagnosis was uh, fibroadenoma. And uh, the uh, fourth category is uh, suspicious for malignancy. We have only one case which was uh, signed out as suspicious for malignancy over the past months, and it was a 51-year-old female patient. Uh, she presented with a two by two centimeter mass over the right breast. Uh, on, on ultrasound, uh, it was uh, classified as viral category 4A. Uh, the aspirate was hypocellular and it was predominantly hemorrhagic with few clusters containing uh, pleomorphic uh, cells, pleomorphic atypical cells with hyperchromatic nuclei, and it was uh, found to be malignant on subsequent external biopsy specimen. So predominantly the aspirate was hemorrhagic, as you can see here, but there were these uh, few uh, clusters containing these atypical cells with enlarged nuclei.
nuclei and high NC uh, ratio and the uh, uh, bare nucleus and myoepithelial cells were not seen. So uh, this was signed out as uh, suspicious uh, for malignancy and subsequent external biopsy uh, confirmed that this uh, lesion was malignant. So uh, the last category uh, is malignant. So over the past months, we had 60 malignant. We have seen 60 malignant cases. Uh, and the age range is quite wide. It ranged from 28 to uh, 71 years. And with the mean age being uh, uh, about a decade older than a benign lesion, uh, among this uh, 16 cases, 11 were right-sided breast lesion and four uh, was left-sided breast lesion. Uh, one case uh, was bilateral and uh, all of the patients with the exception of one uh, are female and two of the cases were recurrent uh, breast C in a patient in patients who already have mastectomy three and five years back. So uh, from these uh, 11 patients, six of the patients uh, have axillary lymphadenopathy and uh, cytologic evaluation of the axillary lymph node was also done. And the uh, axillary lymph nodes were also involved by the uh, uh, malignancy. And the size uh, uh, range from 1.5 centimeter to 8 centimeter with the average size of 3.4 centimeter. It was a bit larger than uh, benign lesions. And uh, one patient had a family history of uh, breast cancer. So uh, almost all of the uh, malignant cases are done via palpation guided. Uh, FNAC with the exception of one case, uh, 10 of the patients have ultrasound uh, prior to FNA. Uh, two of the cases were classified as viral category five and majority of the cases, around seven of the cases were uh, classified as viral category four. Uh, five of the cases were viral category five and two of the cases were viral category, uh, uh, viral, viral category 4A and one case uh, was classified as viral uh, category uh, three. And these are some uh, nice gross pictures taken from a patient seen at our cytology unit. This is a male patient presented with this uh, uh, breast lesion at here with the chest with uh, ulceration and reg irregular border. This is a female patient. You can see here uh, fixed mass attached with the underlying chest well with uh, hyperpigmentation in skin color change on overlying skin. This is another patient. You can see this hard fixed mass attached with the chest well with restriction of the whole breast tissue. And uh, these are also other nice pictures. You can see here this uh, lesion, crested lesion with a mass, uh, with a skin change in the overlying uh, uh, breast tissue with pewed orange appearance and nipple retraction. Uh, this is also another picture showing this eczematous lesion over the nipple uh, this patient, uh, with uh, uh, Paget's uh, disease, uh, grossly morphologically, grossly resembling uh, Paget's disease. This is another picture showing the deep orange appearance of the breast lesion with erosion uh, and crusting of the overlying skin. So these are uh, some of the uh, uh, microscopic image taken from our malignant cases. You can see this uh, a quite cellular smear containing this, uh, this uh, loosely cohesive clusters and um, single intact cells uh, consisting of this markedly pleomorphic and hyperchromatic cells with uh, are mixed with some lymphocytes and this was signed out as uh, malignant uh, uh, carcinoma. And this is also a uh, low power view from the same case. You can see smear is quite cellular and cells are markedly pleomorphic with uh, marked variable in morphology between uh, uh, different cells. So this also same case with marked pleomorphism and uh, uh, hyperchromasia and nuclear enlargement. Uh, this is uh, another kid. This is uh, a 28-year-old female patient who presented with uh, 
left breast swelling. This uh, patient was a lactating mother, and FNA showed this discreetive shift of uh, almost monomorphic round cells uh, with, uh, with uh, nuclear enlargement. And uh, this is also another uh, patient. Uh, you can see here this discreetive shift of plasma cytoid cells with eccentrically located nuclei and uh, uh, cytoplasm, uh, plasma cytoid cytoplasm. Uh, this case, uh, uh, this patient has a, a mastectomy and on mastectomy, it was uh, on biopsy, uh, this case was confirmed to be lobular uh, breast uh, carcinoma. Uh, this is uh, another uh, FNA specimen uh, taken uh, from an, our another patient. You can see this uh, quite cellular smear containing loosely cohesive clusters and discoesive uh, sheaths uh, and single intact cells uh, containing this uh, moderately pleomorphic and hyperchromatic uh, uh, cells. Uh, this is also the same patient. You can see this uh, quite cellular, uh, highly cellular smith with at areas the cells try to recapitulate gland-like structure. Uh, they do have this crowding and nuclear uh, overlapping. So uh, these are some of the cases that we've seen over the past months. And thank you for your attention. If you are, have any question, you are welcome. Thank you. Thank you so much for that wonderful presentation. Um, uh, it was great to see the spectrum of cases and even the correlation between the radiologic findings um, that there does seem to be an appropriate skew, right, for things that are more concerning clinically. You do seem to find um, definitive answers for your clinicians. That's wonderful. My first question, I don't see anything in the Q&A yet. My first question is actually to all of our participants right now. My question for you is, do you perform breast FNA in your practice? If folks could, I don't know. I think it might be a little messy, but I would like to see if people do. So one person does not. Um, I'm curious just how many of you may or may not, because um, there are a good number of you on the line. And we know that Dr. Barraquette and Dr. Mireth perform the breast FNA. Um, and, oh, great. So there are some that do and some that don't. We've got 50 50 now <laughs> between the two. And I guess I am wondering. Also for you, Dr. Mira and Dr. Barraquette, when you're performing your um, FNAs, how long does it take approximately, like um, one biopsy per patient? Because it seems that you're not doing um, immediate adequacy, right? But it does seem that you take the cases back and are able to turn around a diagnosis pretty quickly within just a few hours and definitely within a day for the actual performance of the biopsy. Is it 10 minutes, 30 minutes? And do you use numbing medicine for that or any sort of anesthesia? So uh, we do not use uh, uh, numbing medicine or anesthesia. So uh, it mm -hmm. took us uh, around 10 to 15 minutes per patient to do FNA, depending on the cases, uh, depending a uh, huge mass easily accessible for uh, FNA. It will uh, took us less than 10 minutes. Uh, if a patient needs thorough uh, physical evaluation, if they have axillary lymph node, and if we uh, need to take cytology from axillary lymph node, it might take us around 15 to maximum 15 minutes. Uh, and uh, we do not do on-site adequacy assessment. We do not have the fixed thing. Uh, what we do uh, is uh, we will appoint the patient on the next day, and uh, we uh, will uh, review the slide in the uh, afternoon uh, with, with our seniors, and we will sign it out uh, the case uh, on the next day. So the patient will get the result within 24 hours after the procedure is done. Uh, I think I have answered your question. That's great. Thank you so much. 
I'm curious if any of the other panelists have any questions for the group. Oh, and it looks like in addition, there is one more who does do breast FNA at Muhaz. Great. And they do rose also. Um, and or cases that are difficult. And there is one question about differentiating plasma cell mastitis from lobular carcinoma. That does seem quite tricky. And it seems that Dr. Ernst is typing an answer to that right now. I think um, especially in the setting of not having immunocytochemistry possibly to support you, Sometimes I do like seeing that clock face nucleus within the plasma cells, that lobular carcinoma, or just, I think, um, epithelial cells tend to not have that super chunky chromatin, might be a little bit more pale here. And there is one other question for you, Dr. Moref, about your turnaround time, which does seem amazing, less than 24 hours. Um, the question is, do you report in a laboratory information system, like a computer system, do you type or dictate your reports? Yeah, we do use a, a laboratory computer system. It's called the age system. Uh, so uh, we, we use the age system. Uh, it was actually... Uh, we use it for cytology as well as biopsy and hematology specimens. Okay, wonderful, thank you. <laughs> and we will for sure, this session is being recorded, so we will be sure to send out the recording and I can check with um, Dr. Moretz and Dr. Rosano and Dr. Ernst, are you okay with having your slides sent out to the group as well? Or recording only. Please let us know and if we're able to we'll try and send those out to you all. And great, so Dr. Ernst is okay with sending the slides. Um, also, Dr. Moref, are you okay with um, sending your presentation out to the whole group for them yeah, to view? Yeah, I'm okay. Yeah. Yes, Wonderful. I'm okay. Thank you. Thank you. We'll find a way for that. Um, there is one other question about um, breast biomarkers. And I know you mentioned that you do not perform cell blocks or um, immunohistochemistry regularly due to kind of resources and such. Do you have a capacity if needed on a special, I guess, like in a special instance um, to perform any sort of immunohistochemical testing on cytology specimens. And I guess I wonder if they are regularly performed on histology, like the mastectomy specimens or um, other surgical pathology specimens that you may get. So currently, uh, we do not do uh, immunohistochemistry, both on cytology as well as uh, surgical uh, pathology specimens. What we do is uh, after uh, we uh, crossed the uh, mastectomy or surgical pathology specimens, uh, and after we uh, do the H and the evaluation, uh, we uh, give the patient the uh, blocks, the cassettes, and they uh, will uh, have um, immunohistochemistry, ER, PR, and HER2 uh, at private laboratories. We do not uh, have immunohistochemistry at our laboratory. I see. So it's um, the practice that the patient, if they wish to have that information, then they receive the tissue block from you and then they can proceed to kind of pay out of pocket then for yeah. the testing to be added. Thank yes. you very much. Um, and the question going back to the plasma cell mastitis versus lobular carcinoma question um, Dr. Ernst responds that this can be very challenging. Um, 
some of the morphologic differences possibly can be seen between lobular carcinoma and plasma cells. So having a paranuclear Hof in the plasma cells um, carcinoma is often associated with lack of benign tissue in the background if mass forming. And yes, the differential can be difficult. I had noticed that in general, lobular carcinoma Although bland, still, I think the cells seem to be bigger than lymphocytes and um, plasma cells usually. It's slightly bigger, but um, so really comparing, I found this especially in kind of axillary lymph node fine needle aspiration biopsies where you do have a good number of lymphocytes in the background to kind of compare to. And the lymphocytes and plasma cell nuclei, I do find to be pretty similar in size. And often, even when very low grade, the lobular carcinoma nuclei will be larger and the lobular carcinoma cells will be larger. Um, but it is still, they're still quite small overall. It is a relative difference. So it is a very tricky morphologic comparison, but I think it can be done. Uh, though very tricky, for sure. And it looks like there is another question on fat necrosis and abscess, whether that's categorized under insufficient or benign. And yes, so we wanted to check to see. Um, in my opinion, it seems that if you can make a definitive diagnosis by the volume of material that you have, that both fat necrosis and abscess can be categorized in the benign group. But I am curious what other panelists believe and think about that. Thank you, Dr. Jedamu, for your question. Do you have thoughts on that, Dr. Miras? So uh, if there if you found uh, adequate number of epithelial and myepithelial cells uh, in order to confirm that this is not a malignant lesion, and if we are certain that this is a, a fat necrosis and not other neoplastic lesion, uh, I think we can categorize it under uh, fat necrosis. But uh, fat necrosis is a quite is an important differential diagnosis for hypocellular and postcellular aspirates. So it might usually fall under uh, non-diagnostic or insufficient uh, category. But uh, if there is adequate epithelial clusters to rule out that it's not a malignant condition, and uh, if we found other morphologic features, and if we are certain that. Uh, is this is a fat necrosis uh, using uh, all the three uh, um, components, including the pathologic evaluation, the uh, imaging finding, and the clinical finding? I think we can uh, confidently classify it under B9. I agree with you. I think, yes, that is an important finding that fat necrosis is often quite hypocellular. And I think in our practice, when we see the fat necrosis, it often um, is a very, very tiny lesion that we get presented with in patients who usually have already had a partial mastectomy. So they've had a lumpectomy or just kind of like regional resection instead of full mastectomy. And then they, um, present with like very small fine nodularity in the region of resection. And that I think is very difficult um, sometimes to get a lot of cells out. So even in our practice, I would say when it's sparse cellularity, but in the appropriate context um, for us, even if it is hypocellular, I might feel comfortable stating it is consistent, you know, like hypocellular, but it, um, consistent with fat necrosis. If I do see some histiocytes, some giant cells, and I am okay with essentially calling it benign, but I do add a comment that clinically and radiologically, the triple test, right? They need to kind of um, confirm that this is what their clinical suspicion is as well. And Dr. Ernst's response is, it says, it depends on the clinical impression. If it clinically looks like fat necrosis, prior procedure history, or abscess, then it can fit in benign. If clinically worried, 
then it can fit an insufficient triple test beam. Oh, yes. Yeah, see, so we're on the same page here. Um, and there was one other question about the standard protocol for breast cytology being preceded by radiologic investigation. And I think in your case, um, Dr. Miraf, it seems that there was only a minority of patients who had actually had a, uh, a formal radiologic evaluation, right, for their lesions. So actually a majority of patients presented to you without um, official imaging findings. Is that correct? Dr. Mura, do most yeah. patients? Yeah. Yes. Yes, majority of the patients do not have ultrasound evaluation at time mm -hmm. of uh, FNA. And is it that they present themselves with a palpable mass or maybe they've already had history and it's um, kind of a more obvious gross clinical finding that they think it's malignant so that imaging is not necessarily indicated. Yeah, in most of the cases, if uh, the patient has a palpable breast mass and if it uh, on physical examination and uh, if, if it looks like malignant, we do not do ultrasound evaluation, rather we will do FNA right away. And in lesions which are quite palpable and easily uh, accessible uh, to do palpation guided FNAC, uh, because of our resource uh, limited limitation, we usually tend to do FNA uh, without requiring uh, prior uh, ultrasound evaluation. So this is Leslie, I just wanted to sort of jump in on that because that is um, important to know uh, that when you're seeing patients without any prior um, imaging and you, um, you, you are examining and find an obvious concerning mass with no prior imaging, then the question is for a subset of lesions which are extensively fibrotic uh, and um, you don't, you know, you, you're not able to pull any cells out. Uh, it sounds like you are, you do have access to then uh, examine that lesion under ultrasound, correct? To then guide you to say, we still need to keep going to try and, and, and see if we can try another area. Um, is, that, is that the case? Yes, that's the case in our setup. So uh, if we uh, do not have, if, if the mass is palpable, uh, but if you do not get adequate uh, cellular uh, material with uh, palpation guided aspiration, we will do ultrasound guided aspiration. Great, and I know there's still a lot more, um, I think there's still more questions, but I just wanted to sort of pipe up with uh, the question regarding uh, distinction between uh, plasma cell mastitis and lobular carcinoma. I just wanted to remind the audience too that for lobular carcinoma, look for intracytoplasmic uh, vacuoles uh, in, the, in, in a subset of lobular carcinomas the, the uh, cytoplasmic drop, the uh, cytoplasmic vacuole will have um, often have a targetoid droplet uh, that is eosinophilic. Um, it, it's eosinophilic on H and E, but sometimes you can see that on cytologic um, smears. And so uh, that's what I teach when you have a discohesive epithelioid population and you're thinking in a different context, is this, could this be signet ring cell carcinoma versus lobular, for example? So trying to find the, trying to examine the nature of what's in the cytoplasm uh, may also help in addition to looking at the nuclear features. So let me turn that back to the group uh, for the additional um, uh, open questions. Thank you, Leslie, Dr. Lomo. Um, so there are two more open questions one is, are proliferative breast lesions reported in FNA material as such? A common wrong trend used to be practiced here in Ethiopia. And so proliferative breast lesions, do you mean like usual ductal hyperplasia or, or atypical ductal hyperplasia? Um, just to clarify on that question. And that I may also defer to usual type, got it. So that I do feel like 
is a little bit tricky. I am going to ask Dr. Ernst for some help and Dr. Lomo and Dr. Mirath as well, if folks have thoughts on that, because I think often that is just a tricky scenario that may or may not be associated with a papillary lesion. Um, and I guess may or may not be associated with a mass in some instances as well. So I think Dr. Ernst is responding to that. Thank you so much um, for responding when you have no voice. We really appreciate your fast typing. And the other, her response is, we often include fibrocystic change hyperplasia in a differential diagnosis under the benign category. So I think it would be within a subset of benign then. And I guess still reported, but it's still categorized within those basic categories. But yes, if there is cytologic atypia, then the category it would fall within would be atypical because there's no ADH diagnosis on FNA. And there was one other question about um, if you could kindly share your experience on approach and evaluation of bilateral gynecomastia, like subareolar swelling in male patients. And um, Dr. Ernst's response is male patients rarely present in our clinic. I think that's parallel between both of our practices. It seems to be there's a far minority of male patients. So we do see them at points. And I would likely perform FNA if asymmetric with concern for malignancy. And I'm curious if other folks have responses to that either. Or if other folks have thoughts on bilateral gynecomastia, like subareolar swelling. I think I've really mostly only seen those in surgical settings, not at our FNA clinic. So I've seen it more on our surgical biopsy side. Um, so I don't know if others have experienced that um, in an FNA cytology setting. Uh, I would have to say that um, in, in full disclosure, we don't uh, perform breast FNA here at our location, but I would agree that uh, definitely a, a asymmetry would be most concerning. Um, and so I would agree with that assessment. Well, in at St. Paul, we do see patients, male patients presenting with uh, bilateral swelling. Usually the practice is to ask for uh, medication history if they are on any antiretroviral and certain antihypertensives and so on. And if you can confirm that they are taking medication, even if they have asymmetry, usually we don't do that. Wonderful. Thank you, Dr. Barakat. I know that we are actually over time now, but I didn't want to cut off the answers to these amazing questions. Thank you all for your active participation and for this great information that was shared. We will be sure to send the presentations. Thank you to our presenters for being willing to send those as well as the recordings um, to you all. And we really encourage more active participation. Please do also send um, any topics that you're interested in having for future Cytology Echo sessions, or if you yourself may have some interesting cases or interesting case topics, please do let Dr. Dan Milner know because I would love to interact with you on future sessions. We are in the process of figuring out our schedule for the coming year for these Cytology Echoes and hope to have you all participate in them. Thank you all so much. Thanks so much, Ali and everyone. And just as a reminder, uh, this is a double month. So next Wednesday, we will have a pathology calls, just like we have uh, the path Africa calls cytology, we'll have an Africa calls pathology next week. So that will be a didactic session. And I will send you the registration information uh, and announcement about that uh, at the close of business tomorrow. So it's a short turnaround. Uh, but we will get that uh, out to you this week. And we look forward to seeing all of you next week. Thank you so much.